Welcome to Mysteries and Mimosas. My name is Max Sterling and I'm here with my co-host, Aria. Hi, everyone. Last week we... Hi, Aria. <laughs> Last week we did a case on Morgan Violi. We presented that case out of Bowling Green, Kentucky. And I just want to mention how... What a tremendous outpouring of support we had specifically from the area of Bowling Green, Kentucky. Our social media posts were shared multiple times. I mean, hundreds of times. And we have had so far the best listening that we've had on any one of our episodes. So I just want to thank everybody for sharing Morgan's social media posts, spreading the word. And it's just kind of a testament how these types of cases not only affect family and friends, they affect entire communities. Yeah, that's that ripple effect that I'm always talking about. Like you said, it doesn't just affect the immediate victim and their family, but some of these cases affect you know, multiple people, whole entire communities. And this is an example of that. And because like you said, on our social media, we've had comments saying, I remember when this case happened. I remember this is what I was doing when this case happened. And that sticks with people. It it reminds me of, you know, you could talk to almost anybody who was alive when 9-11 happened and they'll be able to tell you exactly where they were, what they were doing. And cases like this have that same effect because it's so memorable because it's such a tragedy. Yes. Yeah. It's, you know, a little girl, you don't get more innocent than a seven-year-old little girl playing outside in her apartment complex on a summer day. And that is a big reason, I think, why this sticks with people, that and the fact that it's never been solved. And I really do feel like the people that are sharing this post and are listening to this podcast really want to find resolution for their family. Which brings me to Glenn Violi. You know, I know last week we mentioned how strange his behavior is. And I think, you know, when we when we play this interview with Nikki and Stacy, you're going to you're going to hear some of that strange behavior remembered by them firsthand. And it's not to judge Glenn or convict Glenn of anything on social media. That's not the intent. The intent is to share the information as it's received and it's out there, both by the media and other podcasts and you know, on different forums. And so I think it's important to remember that not only, you know, Glenn was cleared by the police. I mean, two years later, but he was cleared by police. So he's no longer a suspect. I don't know what the full story is on why he was a suspect. Probably just had to do with the strange behavior, like the flowers showing up, the composite sketch, the failed polygraphs, things, things like that. But I think we also need to remember that Glenn lost a child twice in one day. He lost custody to Stacy. Whether or not he knew about that before he showed up, because he didn't show up to court, I don't know. But he lost custody, and then he physically lost her. It's not our place to judge, right? It's not our place to say how somebody should act when their child is abducted. Every single person is different, and every person reacts differently to grief and trauma and stress and a situation like this. So I don't know how you or I would act in that situation. From the outside looking in, do those behaviors seem strange? Yes. But again, it's not our place to say how somebody should react. And yes, he was a suspect initially, like you said, probably because of those behaviors, but he was cleared by police two years later. And the bottom line is, the person who did this is still out there and hasn't been caught. And so our goal with this podcast, as it is with any of our episodes, is to get the information out there so that somebody listening may remember something that could push this investigation in the right direction and eventually lead to the arrest and conviction of somebody who committed this horrible crime. I think it's always worth mentioning to, you know, community as a whole is affected, but it's not about anything but Morgan. That's what it's about. It's about finding, you know, hoping, hopefully finding resolution for that family, for everybody involved, including the community. It's not about anybody but Morgan and hopefully catching Morgan's killer. Exactly. She deserves justice. And I really hope that through this, we can find that for her. Thank you so much for entertaining the idea of doing a podcast interview. And we do understand that it's difficult because we're asking you to live through some of the um, worst time in your life, you know. So I, I would really just like to start with the first question by asking you to tell us uh, about Morgan and what she was like. Yeah, I mean, obviously, a a lot of time has passed since then. Um, Part of the reason I can remember what she was like is because my daughter's just like her. Um, (laughs) She was very 
uh, boisterous, very opinionated. She had a lot of personality. Um, from what I remember, very fearless. Yes, she was. Yeah, she she was able to sort of kind of be more independent at that age than you would think that they would be. Um, she liked to dance. She liked to cheer. She liked to sing, gymnastics. I mean, all, all things girl, really, um, with a touch of a tomboy. And I, mm -hmm. I guess I say that because I felt like I was a tomboy mostly growing up. And, and we obviously, all three of us kind of stuck together as we grew up, our older sister and us. She always had a smile on her face. She's a happy baby. So typical, yeah. typical seven-year-old child, huh? L gr little girl. Yeah. Yes, she was. But do you have any favorite memories of Morgan that you'd like to share? Oh gosh, um, probably the one thing that sticks out to me is she she had a common common phrase that she would use I mean obviously my older sister and I we were three two and three years wait three and four years older than her um, and so we would be talking about something that we did or something that we like to do and she would always say well when I was older than you uh. <laughs> or when I was bigger than you I could do that and it used to frustrate us back then of course but now looking back it's like you'd give anything just to hear that again For but sure. she she would really that's probably one of the, the biggest. I mean, also probably where she got up in front of the entire school and performed a gymnastics routine, <laughs> which was really just a, a bunch of flips back and forth. Um, and that red jacket. Yeah, she, ha she had on a purple leotard and a red hooded jacket. She would not take the jacket off. And every time she did a flip, it would come up over her head. And then she would flip it down and do another flip. Um, so those are probably... To be honest with you, I've blocked out a lot of my childhood, not not purposefully. Um, I can't remember even good stuff sometimes, but I certainly don't remember a lot of the bad stuff. So I, I didn't mean to. I, lots of therapists have told me that that's just kind of my my brain trying to protect her. protect me. So that's probably all I got. Mom, do you have anything? Um, she would used to have me rub her tummy or to carry her because her bones hurt in the leg mm -hmm. or um, she would tell the, she wouldn't go to sleep at night until her sisters would tell her a bedtime story. And she was like, and don't tell me about the one named Morgan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they wouldn't go to sleep. She knew that she was loved and um, she was <laughs> She was so fearless. She jumped into the pool one time. I just had a hysterectomy. And so I was at the complex at the pool because the other two were in school. And I was talking to Margie. And she just went flying over my head into five feet of water. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> She goes, I can swim. I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> she th even though she couldn't, she just knew she could. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> she wasn't scared. She could, do e she could do everything her other sisters did. Stacy, do you want to walk us through the day of July 24th uh, or Nikki and, and just kind of let us know, you know, what that day was like? Um, I got off work. I got off work early that morning. I had a headache. Real bad one, like it wouldn't go away. So they let me leave early because I just started a couple of months before that. And I picked up the girls from the, from Glenn. We went home and I started getting ready for court that day. He wanted custody of all three of the girls. So we were supposed to be in court. So I went. He never showed up. And um, I was granted, of course full custody of Heather and Nikki, but I got physical and sole custody of Morgan. But, you, but she says, of course, Heather and Nikki, because Heather and Nikki, myself and my older sister, were not his daughters. Right. Uh, biologically. I mean, he raised us. He's who we thought was our dad for a long time until an uncle of ours told us that he, that we actually had another dad and he died when we were little. So I, um, I got out, called the girls, got them something to eat. And um, went home, 
I was supposed to work that night. I didn't have any sleep the prior night. And we were watching Pocahontas. And um, she said something. And I was like, I told her I loved her. And that I was so proud to be her mother. They weren't supposed to go outside, but, you know, as kids do, they did. And I got woken up about 12, 12, 15, no. I don't remember the time. And um, you said it was in the afternoon. That Morgan was taken, called the cop, the police, I'm sorry. I, I did grab my car keys, didn't know where I was going. And I don't think I was gone maybe 10 12 minutes, and the next thing I knew, well, the cops showed up. Glenn came. Why? I don't know. Uh, he, he did bring me flowers. Don't know why. And I told him that he was going to be so mad. Glenn had told me it would happen, that, that something was going to happen like that. So when he got there and, and I told him, you got to know Glenn. Okay. Uh, he was he was yelling at me and was telling me he I told you this was going to happen. An officer did come over there and come between us and told him he needed to back away. Um, <clears throat> and then the FBI. There was a, several police officers there, like city. Police, okay. The sheriff's department. It was like it was like a scene out of a movie. There were there were police everywhere in that neighborhood. Um, state troopers, the FBI, and they asked me if they could talk to Heather and Nikki, and I had no problem with that. I said yes, um, no, and they said without you being in the room, and I was like. Yes, I didn't have a problem with that because I didn't have anything to hide. And then I don't, I can't remember if Glenn left and then came back, but I was trying to tell them how to talk to, how to handle Glenn. And they reassured me that they have it, that they, you know, know what to do and how to proceed with that. Next thing I know, he comes out of the bedroom and uh, he was loud, upset. Uh, Another officer stepped in front of him and told him he needed to calm down and that if he had a problem with what they were asking him, he needed to take it up with him because he's the one that trained them. after that, it went to hell in the handbasket. From from my perspective, yes, mom, you you went to court, you came home. With our Morgan mom. was not allowed to go outside. Heather and I were; we were a little older, so we went outside to play with Brandon and Ashley, which were two neighborhood kids that we had hung out with multiple times before. They had a little sister named Destiny. While while Heather and which is my older sister and I were out with Brandon and Ashley playing in kind of behind one of the apartment buildings in a a place that we named Thistle Haven. It was really just in the woods and we thought we were cool. It was a hangout for the kids. Um, during that time, I assume is when Destiny went to get Kent. Uh, Kentley, listen to me. That's my daughter's name. Went to get Morgan, and they decided to come outside. Mind you, earlier in the day, and the only reason I'm telling you this is because I think we'll circle back to it, is earlier, earlier, before all of this went down, Ashley and I, we decided to ride our bikes back to our apartment, the ones that Heather and I lived in with mom, and to fill up a milk jug with water because it was a hot July day. I mean, it was in, in Kentucky, it was, it gets very humid and, and nasty. Um, and so while we were doing that, we actually passed a van. And the, the door was open on the van and you could see into it. Um, and so I mental, you know, I still see that to this day. Crazy enough, though, I cannot see a picture of the man. I wait. He waved at us. We waved at him. 
we went in, we got the water. At that time, Morgan was in the apartment. I heard her back there playing with her Barbies um, and, and talking out loud. Uh, and then we went back and then it was just, it felt like just a few minutes later, but it could have been 20, 30. I don't know how long. It wasn't very long before Destiny, the, the other little girl that was with Morgan and her mom came screeching in on, and on two wheels basically to say who, who was taken, what happened. And we didn't know what had happened. We were behind this apartment building. So we were confused by the questions. And finally, when she calmed down, we got out of her, they took your sister. Um, and so I ran back to our apartment mm -hmm. while my older sister ran to another building where we have friends to see if they had seen Morgan. I ran back to the apartment. Mom was asleep on the couch. I, I, I woke her up. I, I mm -hmm. told her that Morgan was taken. She jumped in the car, went up the road. I called the police. I was on, that was the first mm -hmm. time I'd ever called 911. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, you got to stay calm. They can't understand you could just, cause that's what you're always coached. Right. Right. Um, and I was trying to explain to them about matter of minutes mom was back taking the phone from me we're out in front of the apartment building sort of just trying to figure out what happened the police were there within a matter of minutes and again it was just like a scene out of a movie there were there were police everywhere in the months following during that time um they were just yes. all over that yes. apartment complex yes the, the news i mean it was bowling green wasn't ready for something like that um so it was i don't know it was crazy but that's that's as far as the first day goes i mean there there was a lot of family that came in and mom tried to keep it as normal for heather and i as she could as far as trying to send us away with people so that we didn't have to deal with everything that was going on um but i do remember talking to the police that day mm -hmm. i did explain to them you know what i saw in the van and there was like this old the only way I knew how to explain it back then and even still now is it looked like a, some sort of material on this old like couch looking thing in the back of this van that looked like it came out of my grandparents' house because it was so old. Um, and I, I just was able to ex explain that to them. We were able to talk to Destiny. Now, Destiny and her family had not lived there for very long. Yeah. And her story like, kept changing too. Yeah, her her story. She was little though. I mean, she was five years old. It's sure. not it's not uncommon for her story to change. But there there were, as you can imagine, over the years, many of things have come out, um, and they still do to this day. We still hear stuff. Um, so it's kind of hard to know what to believe and what not to believe. I, I can only tell you what. Now I tried my best to only deal with facts when it came to me telling anything. To my two daughters. Right. Which, which is really important. Yes. Uh, and I did not play the, um, the guessing game. I didn't play what I thought. I tried not to do that in my own head. Um, I de definitely was not going to do that to them. We were young. We didn't understand. I mean, we un thought we understood it, but we didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. well, I still don't understand it. Stacy, you were a single mom, um, mm -hmm. raising three kids yes. and, um, you were working nights at that yes, time. Sir. And, and so you, you picked up the girls from Glenn's house the, that morning. Yes, he had, and it was before six thirty. It was earlier. Yeah. And then you had court with him. Yes, sir. I did. Did he say anything when you picked up the, the, he was girls? not there. He had oh, thought he, he had, our, and I didn't know that he was going to do that. He claims to have not known about court at all. He okay. didn't show up at court. He claims to have his attorney never told him, which he would have had to have been subpoenaed. So we, we still have never really been able to figure that out. But he, he was not there. He did not show up that morning, which is partially the reason mom got all the, the full custody. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure she would have anyway, just from his history. But, um, but that, there was no one there to fight that battle. He wasn't there. Yeah, and he didn't say anything about it because he says he didn't know about it. And, and I guess I'm just kind of curious, um, Stacey, if, you, if you're comfortable answering it, what did that mean to you when he said, I told you this was going to happen, and, and he had said something like this would happen in the, in the past prior to this? 
to to be honest, I, at the time, I I really didn't think anything of. I mean, I really didn't. Looking back, because he he had said it more than once to me. Because usually the kids were outside, but I was sit, either I was right there at the balcony doors, so I could see, and I didn't really let Morgan out without me. Right. Um. It was common, though, for us to roam the neighborhood with other kids. There were all kinds of kids in the neighborhood. It was, it was not. It was not a dangerous part of town. It was not. It was no. not. He threatened mom with a lot of stuff. It's not that he just threatened that something was going to happen to one of us. It was. He threatened her to like to take us from her. He threatened a lot of stuff. He was very. It was a very tumultuous relationship. Mm-hmm. Of course, he blamed me, and and I do too. Um, because he was real when that day when I when I had to tell him, uh huh, he was he lost it. Yeah, he lost it. He was mad at me. He put on a he put on a show, but there were a ton of people there. I mean, family was there. The police were there. Yeah, the he officer put on a show. come over there and told him he needed to back up and to stop. He scared me because I saw I saw him breaking down and losing a shit. Because I kind of crumpled you know i'm not don't want to say i did because i knew that it was my fault he told me it was my fault looking was, looking back though you feel like maybe maybe looking, there was more to yes that than looking what you back, back then. over others over the whole thing hmm, it does make you want to scratch your head and say huh they did do hair samples on me and the girls I had to uh, go to the hospital where I work to give that mitochondria DNA. Oh, yeah, yeah. D- were the mother, yeah. And I did. But when it came to Glenn <laughs> uh, doing a, giving his fingerprints, he, sli- he get sliced a, every one of his fingertips. They had to get a court order to do it. Wow. He wouldn't show up. And then, yes, he did cut his finger with a razor blade, each and every one of them. And his reasoning back then was because he didn't want them to be able to plant his fingerprints. fingerprints. <laughs> Sorry. He called me at work to tell me that. And I'm like, okay, why did you do it? He told me. I hung up. That was it. That's something that... um I've never heard before. And the other thing that I find bizarre is, is that he had made a statement. I I'm, you know, paraphrasing obviously from numerous different articles that he said he was forced by the police to take polygraphs and that he's failed every polygraph he's ever taken. Yes. He's failed five polygraph tests. And then the ones his parents paid for. And, and I, I saw one, um, quote that he had said, and, and I can't remember right off the top of my head exactly what he said, but he said something to the effect of, I wish I could pass one so the police can go do something else. Do you remember yeah. that? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that sounds right. But he was the one who opened the door on that one for the press, for the media. Well, he, I was trying to... He was playing the martyr. I was trying to, I guess lack of a better word, circle the wagons. You know, I had, I wanted to to try to protect the, the two kids I had um, from a lot of it. Uh, Glenn was, was not having that. He was very vocal, very, told him everything. Like that night, they wanted, they, one of the, FBI agents asked me if I would go take a lie detector test. And I was like, yes. Um, said something along the lines of, uh, we're not going to be full like we were with Susan Smith. And I'm like, well, what the hell was I going to do with the other two kids? And then that's when Dick Glenn, the I guess the head guy. The FBI out of Texas. <laughs> yeah. He uh, said, no, this, this is not how we want to do this. This is not, you know, what I want. But um, Glenn went that night 
and um, I was going to go the next morning. Um, he had stormed into the apartment the next day and told me I wasn't going. And I'm like, yes, I am. You know, they already, a detective was there to take me. And I said, yes, I am. He goes, no, you're not. You don't know what they're going to do to you. Da-da-da-da-da. I was like, look, can't be no worse than what I'm going through now. Sure. I'm going. So that's when the detective, it was a woman, who told him to shut up. That it was my decision. That's what I wanted to do. And we left. That was a really long process, by the way. Um, yeah, they're not fun. No, sir, they're not. I didn't even know you did one. Yeah. See, um, this is how, how how often we don't talk about it. I, didn't even, I never even knew that she did one until right now. Sure. Um, that was a seven-hour ordeal. Like, really? Well, okay. was, but they okay. asked me about my father. This is a side note. My father's been dead since I was six. It wasn't easy. But we went over the questions over and over and over for well, hours. So I did the lie detector test. You know, I couldn't hesitate. I couldn't blink. I couldn't close my eyes. Um, I did more than one. I did more than three. Well, shit. I, I did... Even years after Morgan, I did them. Well, and Glenn says that he failed his, at least this is what I remember as a kid, him telling me, mm -hmm. was that they got him in the room and they got him so worked up about what had happened and making him feel like it was all him and it was his fault and he did it, that he failed the test. Because it's all based on, and this is him saying this, I don't have any idea, I've never taken one. That it's all based on emotion and being able to keep your cool. Um, and so he, that was, that's what he told me when I was a kid. Cause I, I was, you know, obviously as a, a 10 year old, it was hard to understand when you're, when you're saying, Oh, my dad didn't do it. I, 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 he would never do that. And then you find out he's failed five lie detector tests. And, and that was his way of explaining it to us mm -hmm. was, that they, it's their fault. The police did this to me. They're, they're the ones that are painting me into this bad person. And, and they're the ones in the press that are ruining my name and smearing my name. And he couldn't get a job. And yeah, so I, his behavior was strange throughout. And then it sort of, once they cleared his name, it died down. But he still always played the martyr. I mean, it's always the world's against me. They're trying to blame me for something I didn't do. And, and I'll tell you what I've told everyone. I saw the man that day that took my sister. It was not my dad or Glenn. It was not Glenn. But do I think he may know something about it? I do. If you saw him today, I've only seen him on interviews that he's done for this. Um, and then I saw him last year at the cemetery where I essentially walked right past him like I didn't know him um, when he thought he would speak to me. But um He's guilty. He's guilty of something. Something is eating at him. Do I think that he killed my sister? No. Do I think that he abducted her? I know he didn't. I was there. The, the guy that they say took her was not the man that I waved at and that I saw that day. Could I pick him out of a lineup? Absolutely not. But I know that he wasn't my dad. Now, I will say that I, over the years, I will talk to Nikki about it. I will talk to Heather about it, but we're Together, not, together. not so much. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, Heather does get really highly agitated, and I just try to keep her from. Well, we're all broken, right? I mean, we yeah. we're consistently trying not to upset the other person. <laughs> uh, as a kid, you don't want to get upset about it because you don't want your parents to get upset. So I tended to hold everything in until I was. What, 10 years later, and then I had yeah. a nervous breakdown. Yes, you did. And I, to this day, I still hold stuff in. That's just who I am. That's how I built myself. While mom had to sort of just grin and bear it and get through it for the sole purpose of raising her two other children. Other other than that, I don't think she would, she would be here today. No. 
I would not. It's interesting that you say that because it, it's just such a great example of how um, people deal with grief in, in their own ways, in different ways. And for Stacy, it, it seems like your focus was to try to deal with what was happening and still be a, a, a positive influence role model and mother for uh, for your other two daughters. I just tried to do, I wanted to protect them as much as I could. Mm-hmm. Because it was a shit show. It was. You know, we had media, I mean, newspaper vans. And I'm not talking about just vans. They were like trucks with the satellite dishes on them. (laughs) Yeah. And it was hard enough going through that without having a camera in your face. And, you know, I told the girls then. And even before that, I had told all three of them that we can get through anything together. Right. So after that, you know, I was like, it's just us. It's us against the world. And, and she did try to protect us. I mean, that, it was unfortunate that she couldn't, though. I mean, we still went to school. We still were around other people. You know, and did I get phone calls that I had to come and get them from school because they were upset, oh, you yeah. know, because other kids would come in and tell them what Grandma or Billy Bob down the street had to say about it, their relatives. And it would upset them so much that I had to go and, and get them from school. Yeah, I would go stay the night, try to stay the night with somebody, and mm-hmm. I couldn't. She didn't know having to come get me because I was too scared that the person was going to come get me. Mm-hmm. So it was it was traumatic. Mm-hmm. Did I make mistakes? Oh, yes, I'm sure I did. I know I did. Well, nobody ever knows. Nobody ever expects this to happen to them. Nobody's really prepared or knows no, it, how to handle those situations, right? So you did... You did the best you can, which is all anybody can do. You know, so. you know when you have kids, it doesn't come with the book that says, okay, <laughs> exactly. if your kid is ever, you know, abducted, this is, you know, no. Right. You know, and they, they will tell you the five stages of grief, grief. You know what? What they also don't tell you is that you're going to go through those five stages of grief over and over and over. That's a good point. Um, you know, you may go through one through four and think, okay, okay, I'm on the home stretch. Oh, hell no. You got to go back to one. Yeah. You know, going, going through those grief cycles is so individual for every person, right? Like we could, we could all be in a certain situation and, and experience the same thing happening to us. And each one of us is going to take something different from that and handle it differently. So, Mm -hmm. you know, they have those five stages of grief, but yeah, there's no saying how long each stage is going to take somebody to get through, or you're right, you're going to have to go back and and start over here. Um, And it's Mm -hmm. just an ongoing thing. And so, yeah, nobody can really tell you how to handle it. It's, it's, it's going to be specific to you. I have a a coworker. When I was talking to them about doing this podcast, he was like, why do you keep doing these things? And because I've done multiple television interviews um, and, and different news articles. And I just looked at him and I was like, well, who's who's going to do it? Like, who, who's going to keep, aside from my family, who's going to keep our name out there? You know, I mean, it, it, if we don't do this stuff, if we say no, then we're, we're failing Morgan. Mm-hmm. Because the person that did this to her is still out there, potentially still out there. I don't I don't know, obviously, if they're still alive or not, but. That person's still out there, and the, the the part that's probably the most traumatic for me is: Are they in my life now? Like, have they somehow no. infiltrated my life that I'm not aware of? Because I don't remember the person that I saw that day. I do yeah. not. And I, we've talked about mm-hmm. hypnotism. We've talked about other things, but I have done such a good job <laughs> of burying that stuff. Um, and and really overcoming it I mean I, I've certainly made a lot of mistakes along the way and I've hurt people and I've I've done some probably some shady and some bad stuff but just due to the trauma but I have for the most part come out on the other side and I'm too afraid to rip that band-aid open um what it's funny you say that why I don't know because you want me to but I'm not doing it Cause it's easier when I'm telling somebody else to do it. <laughs> um, but I mean, it, it, it's not that I don't want to, because I would do anything to remember the mm-hmm. good stuff of my childhood. I, I just, I'm too afraid to, I, I'm, 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 I'm too afraid to let anyone in that bubble. Um, 
I know it's too scary. It's, 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 will it affect me differently as an adult mm-hmm. now that I have my own kids? Because if I, I can say with no hesitation that if that were me and something had happened to either one of my children, I would be off the rails. I mean, I, I don't think I would have handled it as gracefully as you did. And I know you don't think that you did. And I know that you think that you um, failed, you failed a lot. But a lot of that was out of your control. And you can't you can't fix stupid. I mean, you can't fix people that are going to go around and say things. I've dealt with that my whole life now. People coming up and saying, I, I know this. And, hey, this person said this. Or it was this guy. And, and hey, this guy killed this girl. It's got to be him. And I mean, y- you deal with that off and on. We've dealt with that for 26 years mm-hmm. now or 20. How I just tell them called. I got to where I would tell people because I did work in a hospital. So you run into all kinds of people there. Um, that if you have anything to say, you need to call the FBI. Yeah. Because it was, it was, it kept me upset. It kept me tore up. And like Nikki, uh, you know, because you know, you hear a lot about statistics. And I really hate that word today. Um, statistically, it's somebody you know or somebody you have already met or it's an acquaintance. And well, then in my little bitty brain, it was a process of elimination for me. When you started cutting people off. Yeah, I cut, cut people, people out. out because... Mom doesn't trust anybody anymore. No. And that has been an ongoing battle since then. No lie. Um, But see, I do. (laughs) Because I learned from that. You can't just assume everybody's bad. There are lots of good people in this world. Yeah. Anyway, sure. let's go back to this. <laughs> Let's go back to these questions. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. But um, I guess the, the one of the lingering questions I think everybody has is, you know, are you aware of any, you know, potential leads that the police might be able to follow up on? I know that a lot of a lot of crimes are solved now that you know we're decades old because of DNA. Is there any other leads that the police are able to follow that you're aware of? So I'll t- I'll tell you this, and then Mom, I'll let you speak. Um, mm-hmm. I know. So there was a, an original FBI detective who was like family to us. Dick Glenn. His name was Richard Glenn. He goes by Dick. And Bill Walter. And then Bill Walter was local police chief at the time. I yes. think. And he was the. He was a good this man. Going to be a side note. When they came and got me to take me to the FBI office, that they were going to break the story of where about the remains. I walked in to the FBI office and it was packed full of people I've never seen in my life. But Bill Walter stood out to me because the look on his face was what was in my heart. He was broken. Yes. It affects police officers. I don't think and, people uh, acknowledge that. That's what come Bill is, is holds a special place. Right. Well, he does, and, and I think even Dick Glenn, I mean, I, yes, Dick Glenn. I remember being so mad at him when I was a kid <laughs> because I would ask to see the photos of my sister's dead body, um, and he wouldn't let me. He would not let me. He because I said he swore he, that I would never get to, and then, unfortunately, a few years back, um, he retired, and a new detective was assigned to the case. And he let me see those photos, and that is something I can't unsee. Uh, and my mom happened to be with me that day, so I ruined her life that day too. For, she did not from begging this man to let me see these photos. And as you can, I don't know what stories you've read or, or what you know, but there, there was not left much left of her body when they found it. Um, so it was uh, very traumatizing. Can't can't take that back, but that's okay. Um, curi- no, curious can't. minds want to know, I guess. Sure. So, as far as new updates, though, um, no. yeah, I, I don't, I, I mean, every time we talk to them, which is not often, and mom hasn't spoken to any of them in a while, just because she's kind of always said, like, don't call me unless you know something. Well, no, Dick Glenn, God love him. He put up with a lot family crazy ass over the years. He told me that I would never see those photos, not even if I got a court order. 
because he would get another court order blocking it. He's like, that's not something you want to see. I mean, good, good for him because I'll just say it, that other detective that allowed you to look at those photos, they failed you. I mean, that's my experience, and I've I've done this a long time, and I've ha- I've been on scenes where, you know, family, loved ones are dead, and you know the coroner is moving those bodies, and the family wants so badly to see what's going on, and they want to see it, and you know I've ha- I've been in situations where we've had to physically restrain family members from seeing it because we have to do everything we can to protect them from that. Did I appreciate it at the time? No. Right. I was like. Dick, I just buried my daughter. I think I can handle it. He was like, go home, say safe. Yeah, I remember being at the funeral, and, and because it was a closed casket, I remember us standing up there threatening to open it. Yeah, it was, it was you know, as far as leads, though, um, when I talked to Dicklin a few years ago, he was actually already retired. Um, there was a little girl very close to us, that uh, not, not close to our family, but close in proximity, um, who was taken at a football game and and just brutally murdered. Um, that's all I'll say. And the, the man that did that to her was actually behind bars. They, they, they figured it out very quickly. The the Scottsdale police did a really good job and people, as you can imagine, were trying to compare his photo with a composite sketch. There's two different deposit sketches. Mm -hmm. There's the one that Heather did with the police department. And there's the one that Heather did with, with Glenn. And he's, got her so messed up in her head to make her believe that that's the accurate one that she will not agree that the other one was even one that she gave and I was there when she gave it so I know that she did and I, when I talked to Dicklin a few years ago he he just essentially told me Nikki I've been doing this for however long it's, it's been what 20 30 years I don't know uh, and, and I can just tell you from my gut that it's not him but you know there there was DNA found in the van that they've never been able to compare to anyone's. It's not on record. Um, that didn't match the owners of the van that it had been taken from. And that his, his, I guess his, his DNA didn't match to whatever DNA or fingerprints or whatever it was that they had um, does not match. So mm-hmm. he was 99.9% sure that Timothy Madden had nothing to do with mm-hmm. Morgan. Morgan. I think they still get tips because we still hear, or I still hear stuff. Heather still hears stuff. Um, mom hears it from us, probably yeah. just more as questions. Yeah, mm-hmm. more, more than anything, I mean, it's it, if that person is still out there, if it is indeed true, some of the stories that we've heard as far as drug lords and <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> um, what is it, the Mexican mafia? I think is mm-hmm. one that I've heard. So I mean, if, if you just want to try to protect your own family, you know, and I, I wouldn't do anything to put my kids in harm harm's way, right? Well, do you, if you want, we can we can switch gears and and just hope, you know talk about the police investigation and and Stacy, maybe you're better at at, at um, answering this than Nikki because you you went through this. But did you experience any failures? What did law enforcement do well? What was your experience during that time and even even through to today? Was there anything that um, stands I'm out? I'm going to say, God bless Dick Glenn because. I drove him probably crazy for the first five years after that. It took me a long time, many years, to realize that she wasn't coming back. And I know that's kind of not accepting it, whatever. I did call him all the time and ask him if they were sure. (laughs) They came to her funeral at the church service, and I asked them then if they were sure. And they were like, Stacy. I wouldn't let you go through this if we weren't 110%. I think Dick did a wonderful job as far as trying to protect the investigation or try to protect me in his way. He always tried to deal with facts with me, which I in turn did with my kids. I mean, in my head, you know, your mind can run a thousand miles a minute about ifs, woulds, and couldas. Did this happen? Did that? You know, I tried not to go there. And I certainly wasn't going to do that with my kids. Right. I did appreciate, I really did appreciate that Dick Glenn only dealt with facts. And then when that lady from Dayton, Ohio, said that she saw Morgan, this lady calls me out of the blue. And I'm, and my phone number's enlisted. It was even before that. I asked her how she got my number. She told me. I listened to her. I asked questions, 
It wasn't Morgan. I didn't tell her that, but I did call Dick Glenn, and he was like, how did you hear about this? I told him. He goes, they said, we haven't even talked to this lady yet. I was like, okay. I said, but it's not her. He goes, how do you know? I said, she got her eye color wrong. I really did not have a bad experience with that. I mean, to be, and I'm, I'm being honest, do I think one of the FBI agents could have taken a class in sensitivity class? Yes. Did I tell him that? Yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> um, and also I said I didn't want to deal with him anymore. Did you ever have like, like a liaison, like a victim advocate back then? No. No. I don't think no. they failed us. I think that they just weren't ready for something that big. I mean, our town, it's much bigger now, but mm-hmm. it, back then, I mean, I, I don't think Bowling Green was prepared for something like sure. that. Whether it be police department, it's, FBI, or whatever. I mean, again, I'm going to be honest. Do I think mis- mistakes were made? Yes. But I'm not going to sit here, nor have I ever pointed fingers. Because ultimately, I'm the one that screwed up. I wouldn't say that at all. What I see is a single mom who's doing everything that she can to get custody of her kids, to do the best thing that she can do for her kids, and you're you're literally working night shift to provide for three kids after, you know, a failed marriage for whatever reason. And you're going to court and you're doing everything you can to fight for the three kids that you had. And yes, you, you fell asleep on the couch. You're entitled to sleep. And, you know, you can't continue to 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 be a, you know, a, a helicopter mom 24-7 because you have to rest because you have to provide for your kids. So no, you didn't do anything wrong. And, um, you know, you're entitled to those, you know, naps on the couch or sleeping during the day when you work nights. And I think that it's fair to say that if you could see the future and you knew anything like this would, would happen, of course you would do everything you can to protect your kid. Um, all of them, all of your children. And I was, I was a helicopter mom. More so after that. Oh, yeah. Oh, I bet. Yeah. It was bad. But I'm not <laughs> now. I mean, I, and I think because of that, I don't want to punish my kids for my childhood. I mean, it's not. I didn't say it as punishment. I know you didn't. But I, as a kid, it felt like I was being punished because I couldn't go out and do. I couldn't go to the mall and hang out with my friends. I couldn't. Not until I was much older. I think I think it's normal to blame yourself. I mean, I I, I also blame myself for a long time. I thought if well, I was the big sister, I should have been with her. I she shouldn't have been outside, and it could, should have been me. I wish it would have been me. I mean, those are things that we all you know. And I've tried to tell the girls. I mean, Heather and Nikki, it was not their fault, and I never ever in my mind blamed any of them ever. Sure, and and the only person to blame are mm-hmm. the person or persons potentially that did this mm-hmm. exactly. nobody else exactly it was nobody's fault but theirs they they made that decision that day um it's it's all on that person i've come to terms with a lot of things over the years i don't know if y'all have ever had to when you have an irate mother <laughs> per se banging on the desk saying i need to understand somebody make me understand david Brad was a detective with the Bowling Green Police Department. He was with Dick Glenn in the office that day. He calmly looked at me and crossed his legs, and he was like, Stacy, we don't understand it. And this is what we do for a living. This is what we chose to do. Your mind doesn't work like whoever did this. And I wanted to know why, why, why. As years went on, to be quite frank, If they found the person today, would it change anything in my life? No. Nothing. If anything, it would just open those wounds. I think it would give me somebody to direct the anger that I kept deep down. You know, people who take somebody's life for what? Because you're mad? God gave me peace about about the 20-year mark, a little bit. I don't know how or why, but he did. Thank God. I think you just want to know, as someone that's been through it, at least for me, I want to know that other people have been through it and they've come out on the other side. Mm -hmm. Because as much as I like to believe that I have, 
I haven't sometimes, you know, there are days where I'm just, it feels like it just happened. Um, there is days like that. And then some days it feels like it was somebody else. Mm-hmm. Were you ever offered any kind of victim services during this experience? Or it sounds like you were working pretty directly with the FBI agent and the detectives on the case more than having like a victim liaison. I wish we had one. Well, Phil Walter did approach me three times about um, taking $25,000 from because uh, of the victim's advocacy thing. Mm-hmm. But I could not bring myself to do that. Not that I had too much pride because, yes, I wasn't working for a while, for three months, you know. But I felt like you want me to take money because my daughter was murdered. Nope, mm-hmm. not going to happen. Right. So the third time he approached me, I told him, don't do it again. Mm. And we saw a therapist, but it was because you, because mom wanted, like knew that we needed to. It, it had nothing to do with someone providing that access. Because right. I've asked for it, actually, a few years ago mm-hmm. when I was having a really hard time. And I started to write a book about this. I asked for that. And I got nothing. Mm-hmm. And it was from the previous. There's a new detective on it now. It's a female. I've only... Talked with her via text message, but um, no, we've, I've never been offered anything. I think it would have been very helpful. Um, but I just couldn't see myself doing that. I didn't even know they offered you money until the did other I day. Want, did, I, did I need the money? Yes. Mm-hmm. But mm, no, thank you. It didn't sit right with me. And Bill, God bless him, he tried to explain, say, see, it's not for that. It's to help you. And the girls, and I'm like, no. I still saw it as you want to pay me off Blood because money. my daughter was murdered. And um, I couldn't do that. No, I didn't. You know, the the liaison thing, it would have probably helped, I guess. I don't really know what their role is, so I can't really say. You know, Dick was the type that I'm not going to call you unless I have something to tell you. Hmm. He didn't call me over every tip he got, but he was, I think he was right in how he he dealt with me. Yeah, he offered support, but I don't think there was ever any professional or victim. One thing I learned as a parent that was really hard for me, I think for every mother, it would, it's hard or father for that matter. Uh, You know, when they're small and they get hurt, you you kiss it and you put a band-aid on it, right? And it makes it better. But I couldn't put a band-aid on this one. And I knew I wasn't the one that could help them. So I wanted them to get the help that they need. And we had therapy, but it mm-hmm. it, it, it didn't it didn't work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it didn't work. But there was there was so much going on then. It wasn't mm-hmm. just that. I mean parents were getting divorced. That happens. Our uncle kills himself. I mean, it was a, it, there's been a lot of tragedy in our lives, our lives even before then and, and since then. And it's you just become very numb to it anyway. Um, at this point in my life, I'm just waiting for the next person to die. I know that sounds terrible, but that's just the God's honest truth. Mm-hmm. And I think you probably feel the same way. We're very twisted. We, I do have a warped <laughs> sense of humor. We do. We do. At funerals, we, we tend to laugh sometimes because that's what gets us through them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. And that's no lie. And that's, but it's a healthy thing, in my opinion. I mean, um, can't take everything for Like, I work at, I worked at the hospital. Great the deal. chaplain came to me one morning, and he goes, "Can I talk to you?" I was like, "Yes." He goes, "Stacy, I want you to talk to some, to a couple." I was like, "Why?" They just lost their child. I was like, "Oh hell no." He goes, "Why?" He goes, "I think you could help them." I said, "You know what?" I said, do you think they woke up this morning thinking they're not going to see that that little girl? No, they didn't. They don't want to talk to me. They don't want to see me. They just need time. Mm -hmm. And I had friends who lost their kids. I didn't offer any advice other than to be kind to each other. If they called me, I would listen. I'd let them cry. 
I'd offer to, you know, take them to the woods with a baseball bat. Or if you wanted to just sit here and drink or break plates, you know, yeah, yeah, I did do that for the girls. Break, I would, break dishes. She used, yeah. to, she used to let Heather go outside and break dishes. Yeah, wow. I get dishes at the dollar store to get to get her anger out. There's a lot of anger, obviously. Right. When something like this happens, and you tend to just bury it. Well, I do anyway. I do. My sister does not. She she wears her emotions on her sleeve, which is I'm jealous. I mean, as much as she drives me crazy and as dramatic as she is, I'm jealous that she can get it all out. Mm. And I, mine's just stuck. <laughs> you know, I, I agree with Nikki. I think that's where I'm at. It's it, I'm stuck. You know, like when Nikki a couple of years ago wanted me to go to therapy, and I'm like four. Because you're a hair away from a nervous breakdown. You want me to rip this Band-Aid off a 25-year-old sword? It's easier to tell somebody to do that, though, than it is. <laughs> um, <'cause they're laughs> going, no, not going to happen. For sure. Yeah. Because I do agree with Nikki on one thing. I don't know how, because I, by the hair of my teeth, got this far in life. So I really keep it stamped down. Well, I think I think that, you know, you're personality that as strong as you were for not only yourself but you know your your other two children I, I i mean you're an inspiration definitely to me and i'm sure others as well because that is the most difficult thing that any parent can go through um so yeah what well, do you have any advice for any other parents or people families you know homicide survivors um, or anybody that might find themselves in a similar situation as you, do you have any advice for those people? What might help keep them going? Somebody asked me that recently. How did I do it? I told them a wing and a prayer and on my knees. There was a lot of nights I couldn't sleep. There were so many, I can't even tell you. So many times I prayed to God, just told, just, I can't do this anymore. It's not that I love Morgan any more or less than I did my other two. It hurt so damn bad that I was in this black pit. It was just a bottomless advice, pray. I did. I did a lot of praying. I don't ask for anything anymore. You know why? Because God gave me the one thing I wanted. And that was for her to come home. I never doubted she would come home. I don't know why. Just didn't think it would be in a bag either. And that is a hard pill to swallow. I think what I would tell them, talk to somebody. Don't hold it in. And and what about you, Nikki? Do you have any advice you'd like to share? You know, I'd like to say to talk to somebody and don't hold it in, but that's, that's what I've spent my whole life doing, so... Yeah, I mean, I would, I would probably just say to to seek help. I mean, it's okay to cry, which is something I have a hard time with. Yeah. Um, it's okay to be mad. Yeah, be mad. I feel all of the emotions. Um, I mean, there are days that I feel dead inside, yeah. and, and I, I've done that to myself. I know I have, but uh, it's what gets me through life. But I don't wish that on anybody. I mean, I see it in my niece, one of my nieces. I see her kind of bottling stuff up, and she's been through some stuff too. I mean, not not anything like this, thankfully. But for anyone that's gone through something like this, reach out to other people. I wish that I hadn't been so young, so so maybe I would have had the resources to be able to reach out to people that have, this has happened to. I think to have been around other kids my age that had had been through some sort of trauma even close to this would have been helpful um and maybe would have made me less angry growing up I think I was always so angry when people would be like oh yeah well my dog died that's not the same um and it, it's not the same in, in and I'm not trying to take away from anyone's pain but it's not the same as in you losing a sibling to you know, them getting sick and dying, that's still very traumatic. And I'm so sorry, but I still don't even know what happened to my sister. She was taken away from our family, gone for three months and then comes back dead. And I was not like my mom. I, I immediately thought she was never coming home. Um, I guess I'm calling me a pessimist. <laughs> I just looked at things. I guess I was preparing myself for the worst. And I've always done that as well. 
So I, I, I guess all in all to say, go to church. Um, like mom said, pray, pray about it. It's, it's probably the only thing that's going to get you through. It took me a very long time to find the forgiveness. And I know that's hard for my mom to hear, but it took me a long time to find forgiveness for the person that did this. Um, and I, I did, and I have, and I can't change anything about it. I can't go back. If I could bring her back, I would, obviously. Um, but it's also made me who I am today. So, you know, when people ask me, how have you survived it? My answer is, I just had to. I didn't have a choice. I didn't have any other choice. I didn't have any other option. Yeah, it's not like a like a switch where you could just turn it off. Yeah, I, I mean, did. you can you can go to the extreme and, and kill yourself. And trust me, I've had my moments. Now that I have children, that's what I was put on this earth for, was to be a mom. And I have no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that I've gone through hopefully has made me a better mom it has. than what I would have been. Mm -hmm. um, so you just you just gotta you just gotta think of the positive. And I know it's hard to hear that everything happens for a reason. That's the last thing people want to hear. Uh, and I don't ever tell them that in the, initially because I know that's that's tough to hear. But I, I do think things happen for a reason. I don't think I it's guess, fair. I don't even know. But I think it happens for a reason. And it's there's a lot of good that's come from I did the meet, bad. Now, to go back to when we did see these pictures. And it was up on a you know, big television. Yeah, it was a big TV. And I'm like, uh, can you go back? Yeah, you couldn't. I can't see that. You know, and, and he did. And I was like, is that her school? Yeah. Part of it. Yeah. He goes, you've never seen these? I said, no. Dick said I would never see them sort of a court order. And then I still couldn't see them. But it wasn't his fault. He I, the, he was so young. He, it's like, your fault. It is my fault. <laughs> it is. I begged to see them. And, and, and you thought they were different pictures. So you wanted to see them. And they, I just thought. It's my fault. I, I will never forgive myself, and I wish that I could unsee them, but... That was hard. They don't haunt me much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. Know. It's, it's fine, though. I mean, you know, you got you to gotta have a good sense of humor about these things. It wasn't his fault. He was a very young detective, mm -hmm. and he, he thought he was helping me. This was a lifetime of begging someone to let me see these photos, and he thought he was helping. Yeah, mending a wound um he's no longer the detective i don't know if that means anything or what <laughs> he's no longer the detective i think he actually got promoted of some sort so, oh. so now there's someone else but it sounds like from your from your perspective he was just doing what he thought was best at the time and you can't fault someone for that but you know doing investigations everybody makes mistakes along the way you know, we're human yes. when we investigate things and we're not perfect and, and those mistakes happen. And as long as we learn from them and grow and exactly. you know, don't make those a habit or something. Right. But all in all, my experience with, with law enforcement, it was, it was, it was good. Yes, it was positive. That's good. No, that's because good it's hear. not it's not easy for it lives anybody. With them too. Right. I mean, what happened to me is like, it's like it's part of me. It's like an entity, you know, with Morgan. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, and I, I know it's not easy for them because, like I said, poor Dick, I know he was like somebody. Well, I think it still, it still probably haunts him to this day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've met police officers that ended up being my friend later in my life that were actually young police officers then, and it stuck with them. Mm -hmm. So I, I can imagine that every Police officer has Bill, that. We, we still, not all the time, but, you know, we still pick up the phone and check on the other one. When I had to do the interviews, were they sunshine and rainbows and unicorns? No. Those are hard questions. But it wasn't that type of situation either. Right. Yeah, and sometimes, they, you know, they have to ask those questions, you know, so essentially they can move on to the to to doing work to eliminate right. too. So I did them and I did not complain. I didn't bitch. I didn't whine. I did whatever they asked me to. We, we really, really appreciate both of you taking the time to interview with us, talk about it. I know it's very difficult to, you know, relive the, that moment and those moments over the years, last, you know, two and a half decades. But, um, you know, the goal is to hopefully, 
uh, hopefully we'll be able to reach someone that might know something and, and still get tips to bring you some sort of closure, even though, um, you know, it has been so long. We appreciate you guys. Thank you both so much for your time and consideration. And thank you to Nikki and to Stacy for participating in that interview and for sharing their most tragic time in their life. And as always, don't forget to check us out at mysteriesandmimosas.net, where you can find photos, more information, and source material for this episode. And if you have any information at all, please reach out to the Bowling Green Police Department at 270-393-4244. And if you have any further information or anything to add, we are always happy to do a follow-up interview to this episode as well. Just reach out to us on uh, our website, mysteriesandmimosas.net. There is a, I guess, a little comment box that's in there. Still haven't quite figured that thing out, but you can reach out to us. It goes right directly to our email, and we will reach back out to you if you're interested. Or if you have another case, episode, suggestion, or a mimosa recipe. I know we skipped out on it this week. Sorry to all our listeners for that, but if you're really interested in a mimosa recipe, my favorite is champagne more champagne and then a splash of your favorite juice all right that about wraps it up cheers cheers